Welcome to No Better Death, the podcast that knows while you can die no better death than your own, that doesn't mean we can't take a look for the unusual and noteworthy in the deaths of others. Each week we'll take an in-depth look at some out-of-the-ordinary deaths and the events surrounding them. This show will contain explicit language and graphic details. I'm your host, Sick Grayson. How's it going, everybody out there in podcast land? I hope you're doing well. Uh, Everything's fine here in the Grayson household. Nothing major to report. Uh, I will apologize for being a couple days late on getting this out. I had a head cold for a few days, and I was spending Valentine's Day time with Miss Grayson, so it just wasn't really fit to be recording and was a little bit busy. But I can actually breathe again today, so here I am doing this. We're getting into part two of our Goth Legends series. The first, of course, was Joy Division's Ian Curtis, and I was originally going to talk about Typo Negative frontman Peter Steele for the second one, but I can't really find enough reference material, so I went ahead to my third selection, Christian Death's Roz Williams. Uh, Typically, I don't like covering people prettier than me, but at some point, Roz or Pete Burns was going to get brought up, so it was bound to happen. That's a joke. Uh, Most material I was able to find was just uh, regurgitations of a handful of original articles, so while I was able to find enough references to make an episode, I don't have my usual 15 to 25 pages that usually runs about an hour or more, so if this episode falls a little bit short, that's why. Uh, And I am going to recommend, I found Roz's last known audio interview. It was with Golgotha Magazine in 1997 and runs about 28 minutes. You can find it on YouTube. I was going to tack it on to the end of the episode like I usually do with interviews or news footage, but 28 minutes is a little long, so I'm just going to refer you to that interview if you want to just hear him in his own voice or learn more about him. Uh, It's a pretty good interview, so uh, if you want to, go on YouTube, check that out. Roz was born Roger Allen Painter on November 6th, 1963 to a strict Southern Baptist family Right here, having been raised Southern Baptist myself, I can say this probably explains a lot of shit about Roz. Uh, In Pomona, California, the youngest of four siblings, he had one sister and two brothers. And while his older brothers preferred to listen to bands such as Leonard Skinner, with his sister adhering to Janis Joplin and similar artists, as a child, Roz was a fan of David Bowie, Roxy Music, T-Rex, Alice Cooper, Iggy Pop, and the New York Dolls. So at a very young age, he had excellent taste in music and would be influenced in his teens by bands such as Throbbing Gristle. From these influences, he cobbled together his own style separate from that of the UK goth scene. While bands such as Joy Division and Susie and the Banshees had been progenitors of the scene, influencing everything from the sound to the visual aesthetics of goth rock, Roz was responsible for creating the style of American West Coast Gothic, influenced by, as many believe, being gay in an intensely religious household and a desire to reject the hyper-masculine and often homophobic L.A. punk scene. By the age of 16, he began performing in bands. He took the name of Roz Williams from a gravestone he found in a Pomona cemetery. His first bands were called The Crawlers, No, and then later The Upsetters. He sang and played the guitar, though the band never performed on stage. He then went on to form the Asexuals. In addition to being the lead vocalist, he played the organ and guitar with Jill Emery also contributing vocals as well as playing bass and Steve Darrow on drums. Their performances were limited to a few parties. And I'm just going to say here in the beginning, Roz had a lineup of about 25 musicians that he worked with almost like they were on a rotating platform and he just picked whoever was available. So there's going to be a lot of names thrown at you over the course of this story. Some may sound familiar because a lot of them were in other bands from California, most notably 45 Grave and Social Distortion. Roz then sang in a band called... Dalcus Corota, and I know I'm probably not pronouncing that right, I've never known how to pronounce it and never looked it up, uh, with Mary on percussion and Jay Albert on guitar. And though still in the early days of crafting his personal style and the sounds of the band that would make up the hodgepodge of his career, Roz's music was already taking on the characteristics that would define his work in its entirety. It combined the morbidness of Edgar Allan Poe with the poetry of Baudelaire and presented the listener with the dark, macabre aspects of the human experience. Albert and Williams then went on to form Christian Death in October 1979 with James McGeerty and George Bellinger. 
Originally, Roz described the name as a bringing together of opposites. Christianity is so life-reinforcing, live by these rules, you'll go on to eternal life, and death is the complete opposite of that. Quickly realizing this opened the band to accusations of being pretentious or pseudo-intellectuals, Roz began to refuse to discuss the band's name. Later, he said some band members had been throwing names into the air. One person was wearing a Christian Dior t-shirt, and someone suggested Christian Death as the band name as a play off Christian Dior. So there's a few different stories about the band's name. It suited Roz's dislike of organized religion. In interviews, he often stated that any belief in God should come from the individual and be explored internally without automatic acceptance of church's creeds. Learn to accept yourself for who you are and screw other people's expectations of who you should be. The band broke up temporarily in 1981 and Williams formed premature ejaculation with performance artist Ron Athey, with whom he had been living. After only a few live performances, including one which involved Athey eating a crucified roadkill cat, clubs began refusing to book them. Williams then restarted Christian Death in the summer of 1981 with McGeerty and Bellinger, who also brought in guitarist Rick Agnew, who had previously been with the Adolescents. In 1982, the band released their debut album, Only Theater of Pain, which included the almost instant classics Romeo's Distress and Spiritual Cramp. Agnew and Bellinger left the group that same year with guitarist slash Roz's future wife Eva Ortiz and drummer Rod Figueroa stepping in as replacements for live performances. By the end of the year, the band had broken up once again due to drug problems. In 1983, Williams formed a new band under the Christian Death name, this time with former members of Pompeii 99 with whom Christian Death had performed at a live show the previous year. The new lineup consisted of Williams as frontman, Valor Canned on guitars, Gitane Damone on keyboards, and providing backing vocals, Constance Smith on bass, and David Glass on drums. This union was a superb match with Roz singing the vocals over the haunting, more surreal sounds of the new band. The album's Catastrophe Ballet, released in 1984, and Ashes, released in 1985, would be created from this combination of talents. Towards the end of 1983, they were invited to appear on U.S. music TV show Media Blitz, where they mimed to Cavity and Romeo's distress and gave a short interview. Their first European show was at Le Bains Duché, Paris, on February 12, 1984, and they continued touring Europe until June. Catastrophe Ballet was recorded at Rockfield Studios in Monmouth, Wales, around the same time. It was a departure from the religious overtones of their debut LP. Catastrophe Ballet also featured a change in Williams' vocal delivery. While only Theater of Pain and the Death Wish EP had Williams presenting a rhythmic spoken word style with an almost androgynous pitch to his voice, Catastrophe Ballet showed a richer, less harsh side to his vocal stylings, with more influence from David Bowie and Lou Reed. Rather than the occult-oriented lyrics from the first album, the singer showed a newfound interest in surrealism and the Dada movement. Canned, Damone, and Glass shared these interests, and the synergy between them helped cultivate the musical change from the old band's murky, dark punk to a more elegant, romantic strain of guitar-driven rock, though a tribalistic drumming was also added into the mix. Roz was enjoying living in France, home of his many artistic and literary heroes, Constance Smith left the band following the recording of the album and in live shows was replaced by Dave Roberts of Sex Gang Children. And you guys probably have no idea who any of these people are, do you? In autumn of 1984, the band returned to America and recorded the Ashes LP, which was released the following year. Roz, Valor, Gitane, and David Glass provided much of the music for the record. However, guest appearances were made by Randy Wilde on bass Eric Westfall playing violin and accordion synth, and Infant Seven Canned crying, Bill Swain on tuba, Richard Hurwitz on trumpet, and Michael Andreas on clarinet. So they brought in a bunch of different instruments and musicians for this album to help expand their sound. And this is really what started to separate their sound from that of, say, the UK goth scene, the local punk scene, or any bands coming up doing goth or death rock much like they were trying to do. They, they started expanding their horizons and their sound. 
The band performs shows in America to promote the Ashes album, climaxing with The Path of Sorrows Extravaganza at Los Angeles Rocky Theater on April 6, 1985. This multimedia extravaganza featured films, a banquet, and a program. Christina Fuller coordinated and supervised the visuals, film sections, and Roz's four costume changes. Their performance at Hollywood Berwyn Entertainment Center a few days before was recorded and released as the Decomposition of Violet's cassette. Roz officially left Christian Death after the American shows in April 1985, citing loss of interest and a distaste for touring as reasons for his departure. Valor took the rest of the band to Italy as part of the European tour. Williams had asked Gatane Damone not to continue under the name Christian Death, and Valor had agreed to change the name of the band to Sin and Sacrifice. But instead of following through with his commitment to this agreement, Valor Can decided instead to keep the Christian Death name, first changing the name to Sin and Sacrifice of Christian Death, and then dropping Sin and Sacrifice totally, just leaving the name as the original Christian Death, much to the annoyance of Roz. Roz considered Christian Death to be his creation and felt personally responsible for it uh, as it was directly associated with his name, his image, his art, and his poetry. He felt that it was his decision, not Valor's, whether the band continued or not. Gitane Damone expressed misgivings about this, and though she didn't initially leave the group, uh, she later on publicly sided with Roz on the matter. After leaving Christian Death, Roz worked on some experimental music with a project titled Premature Ejaculation with Ron Athey, that thing he had kind of done a little bit earlier but then stopped, so he went back to Premature Ejaculation. Uh, he also started another side project called Helltier, and in the late 80s formed Shadow Project with Ava, whom he took as his bride in 1987. Many believe that Shadow Project was the best representation of the direction Roz would have taken Christian Death uh, had things worked out differently. The band lineup included Johann Schumann on bass and Barry Galvin and David Glass, both of whom also recorded with post-Ashes era Christian Death. Uh, the name Shadow Project was taken from the tests in Hiroshima following the nuclear bomb which left impressions or shadows but no bodies. Later on, Williams reformed Shadow Project with Ava O, oh, Jill Emery, Tom Morgan, and Paris Sedonis. Jill Emery left the band early in 1992 to concentrate on her duties on Hole, and Aaron Schwartz was brought in to record Dead Baby Slash Killer for the Welcome to Our Nightmare compilation CD. That was a, it was a cover album of Alice Cooper songs released by Cleopatra, because around this time, Cleopatra Records came calling, hoping to use Roz's cult status to boost its own name and image within the goth and death rock scene. Death rock being a term Roz himself coined to separate his music from that of the more theatrical goth rock that he often viewed as not containing as much substance as his own work. In fact, Roz was known to complain about being compared to Sisters of Mercy when he wanted to be compared to bands that had influenced him, so he start, he's, from the beginning pretty much, he rejected being lumped in with other goth music because he thought his was different. And up to this point, Roz had mostly dealt with Triple X Records. Triple X is pretty legendary in its own right. They have a habit of picking up very young, unknown bands, signing them, and then selling those contracts for big bucks later on. Uh, you may have heard of some of their bands that they launched. Jane's Addiction, Korn, Slipknot, all signed to Triple X in their early days. Uh, and of course, Cleopatra comes snooping around. Uh, their lineup is also legendary. Sex Gang, Children, Spawn Ranch, Revolting Cox, Switchblade Symphony, Raised in Black, the list goes on and on. And more recently, they've been doing this thing of picking up bands that were mainstream big like 20 years ago or so and adding them to like their back catalog. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that part. Uh, I know it's a business move, but Switchblade Symphony and DMX, as much as I love them both, should never be on the same label. So anyway, Roz started working with Cleopatra Records in 1992. Williams had been the only original member of Christian Death left when he departed in 1985, yet the remaining members continued to perform earlier Christian Death material and release several albums under the original group name. And Roz had already recorded two more songs that he never released as Christian Death, uh, Halos and Spectre, and he recorded those with Eric Westfall, but they weren't released for five years. 
Uh, the songs appeared on the Heavens and Hells cassettes, which also included live performances selected by Roz from his own tapes. So you've basically got two bands, two different Christian deaths trying to do music. You've got the band that Roz bailed on still continuing without him, and then you've got him around this time starting to pull from his live show tapes and stuff like that to release material as Christian death also. So it's probably not going to work out well. Roz, Ava, uh, a guy named Listo on bass, and David Melford on drums started recording new versions of classic Christian death songs for the Iron Mask album in February 1992. And they did this mostly to try to get some money to finance a Shadow Project tour in Europe. Peter Tomlinson had replaced Tom Morgan on drums for this tour. Williams also occasionally took part in Christian death reunions during the late 1980s and early 90s with Rick Agnew, the guitarist on the band's first album. In 1992, with the help of Ava, Paris Sedonis, William Faith, Seven Canned, Scat Ella, Stephen Gray, Chris Coles, Brian Virtue, da 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 da, uh, two new Christian death studio albums were recorded titled The Path of Sorrows and The Rage of Angels. Ross had been quoted as saying, The Path of Sorrows is probably my favorite Christian death album. One song, On the Rage of Angels, was written for Jeffrey Dahmer, the American serial killer for whom Roz had a major fascination. For the last time in June 1993 at Los Angeles Patriotic Hall, Christian Death regrouped for a one show captured on the Iconologia CD and live video. Roz was joined by Rick Agnew, George Bellinger, and Casey on bass. Following his brother's decision not to come back on stage to play the encores, Frank Agnew was credited as additional guitarist on the recordings. During some live performances, Roz could be seen wearing a t-shirt which sported the words, Never Trust a Valor. At this time, there was effectively two bands recording and performing material under the name Christian Death, like I pointed out earlier. This eventually precipitated a heated legal battle between Canned and Williams, which was never satisfactorily resolved. Canned often complained there was no point in trying to sue Roz because he never had any money. Roz and Ava were also known to perform solo shows under the name The Original Christian Death. Cleopatra uh, had some balls working with a band caught up in this kind of legal shit, but ultimately, to me, it seems like Christian Death would be Roz's. He started it, he was the last original member when he left, so that leaves him owning all material up to that point, and anyone claiming to be Christian Death after Roz left could legally only make money off new material written, released, and performed without Roz. I don't see how there was any kind of heated legal battle, nor how said legal battle could, could never be resolved. Everything up to 1985 belongs to Roz. Anything without him doesn't. As for ownership and royalties, anyway, use of the name could be a bit murky. We've seen that a dozen times with a dozen other bands, but as best I can tell, Canned Valor won the battle on who got to use the name, as it was decided that Roz abandoned slash neglected the name, so the senior member of the band, being Valor, got to keep the name, and Roz had to bill his act as Christian Death featuring Roz Williams. Bullshit, I say. Total bullshit. I can't just go open a video store named Blockbuster Video because they closed up shop. Wouldn't that be abandonment or neglect? You know, that wouldn't hold up in court, so why the fuck was this able to stand up in court? In 1993, Shadow Project toured America. The band consisted of Williams, Ava, Paris, Mark Barone on bass, and Christian Omar on drums. After this American tour, Ava O and Paris left the band to work on the Ava O Halo Experience album, Demons Fall for Angels Kiss. Shadow Project had come to an end. However, a German tour for October had already been booked. Although all tickets, flyers, and publicity for this tour were credited to Shadow Project, Williams decided that the band name should change to Dalkus Kuroda. Now he's taking it old school, going back to one of the beginning band names he was working with. He sang on the tour with Brian Butler on guitars, Mark Barone on bass, and Christian Omar on drums. For one show, Gatain Damone drove from her home in Amsterdam to Germany to meet up with Williams backstage. The Shrine EP by Dawkus Kuroda was recorded in January 1994. The EP was reviewed favorably by Trouser Press. Is there anything more British than something named Trouser Press? Kuroda returned to Europe for a month-long European tour in November 94. 
Damone and Williams came together to release the album Dream Home Heartache in 1995, recorded by Roz and Damone in Ghent, Belgium, uh, between March and April of 95. Roz and Gatain played a few shows together in April 95 and again in December 95, and they toured UK in April 96. In 1995, following his return from Europe, Williams joined up with Paris Sedonis and Ryan Wildstar to work on the spoken word album The Horse's Mouth, which contained the classic Her Only Sin. At this time, Roz became more open about his heroin use. That is, he didn't deny it, but didn't openly talk about it, and made attempts to come off the drug. Lyrics on the album, co-written by Ryan Wildstar, chronicle a period of heroin addiction from which the two eventually escaped. Shortly following the recording of The Horse's Mouth, Williams began playing bass for EXP, the musical troupe created by Paris and Ryan. In 1997, Williams again paired up with Ava O to record the final Shadow Project album, From the Heart, an extremely intimate album with a notably stripped-down sound for the duo. He also recorded Wound of Exit, his last solo CD as premature ejaculation. In addition to his musical activities, Williams had a keen interest in painting along with collaging and several of his pieces have been exhibited in some dark art shows throughout Los Angeles and Atlanta. He also co-directed and scored Pig, a 1998 experimental psychological horror silent short film with underground filmmaker Nico B. The film stars Roz Williams and James Holen and was produced and directed by Nico B. And Pig was the last work Williams did. I mean, just to have to have been involved in so many projects in such a short period of time. I mean, Roz's discography is massive for no longer than he was actually active making music. He started young and he stuck with it. It was what he lived and breathed. In the introduction for the book, And What About the Bells, Ryan Wildstar, William's friend, bandmate, and roommate of eight years, stated that on March 31st, the night before Williams took his own life, they watched the film Isadora, about dancer Isadora Duncan, during which Wildstar retired to bed despite Williams' protest, who said, you don't even know how it ends. Wildstar replied that he knew Isadora hangs to death at the end after her scarf gets caught on the spokes of her car's wheel, and went to bed. Williams made final phone calls to friends and family that night, Wildstar said that if he wasn't distraught over the death of his boyfriend, Eric Christie's, who overdosed on heroin in November 1997, he would have seen the warning signs to William's suicide more clearly. On April 1, 1998, Williams hanged himself in his West Hollywood apartment at the age of 34. His body was discovered by Ryan, who heard worried messages on the answering machine and broke down the door to William's bedroom. Williams had left a rose on the coffee table in the living room, along with several items, including the Hanged Man tarot card. He left no note. A memorial was held at the El Rey Theater shortly after his death, and a small gathering of family and friends offered his ashes to the earth at Runyon Canyon Park in the Hollywood Hills. Theories have arisen regarding the reason for Williams' suicide, including failing health, depression, bipolar disorder, financial instability, and his fascination with the number 1334, which can be found in the liner notes of his albums, in his signature, and also on his urn. It is also unknown as to why Williams committed suicide on April Fool's Day. In the introduction for And What About the Bells, Ryan states that he views the details surrounding Williams' death as a form of art. A memorial for Williams is located at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and I was unaware of this at the time that I went there a few years ago or I would have taken some pictures. The cabinet in which he hanged himself as well as a few pieces of original artwork are on display at the LA Museum of Death, and I have been there and seen that. Williams didn't like to discuss his sexual orientation publicly and described his marriage with Ava O oh as more of a partnership. First of all, in my research, I came across nothing that straight up said he was gay. He sounds more like an asexual or an androgyne to me. I mean, there's no talk of him having sex, going on dates, talking about liking people. It kind of seemed like his head was into making art and no real focus on any sort of carnal relationship. Uh, but at least once in his own words, he said that he was in an interview with 
John Ellenberger of Golgotha Magazine, 1997. So this is probably the interview I was referring you to at the top of the show. Uh, while discussing the horse's mouth, uh, he talked about how he was hesitant to have his family listen to the album. He stated, There are certain things that I just don't feel need to be shared with them. It was really kind of a difficult thing for me to call and just say, You know, well, hey, guess what? I'm gay. And my mother's response was, Well, son, I'm not stupid. So there is that. There was him saying it once and his mother, I guess, acknowledging it. But nowhere else did I find really any real kind of reference to his orientation. He just kind of seemed to be wrapped up in making art. Williams was raised in a strict Southern Baptist family, but abandoned this as he formed Christian death. As the years went on, as he stated in an interview with Ellenberger, he eventually became a Satanist and practiced magic in the privacy of his home. However, in the mid-1990s, he stated in another interview with Ellenberger that he had developed a close relationship with God. What About the Bells, a collection of Williams' poetry compiled and edited by Ryan Wildstar, was released posthumously in 2010. Williams' creativity had a profound effect on the goth subculture and was also influential in poetry and collage artwork. Annually, fans pay tribute to his life and work. In 2010, Gothic Beauty magazine, in a short film Necessary Discomforts, an artistic tribute to Roz Williams, threw one such event at the Hyena Gallery curated by A Raven Above Press. His widow Ava released From the Heart, a compilation of studio recordings that Roz had completed with her before his death. These are mostly remixes of Shadow Project songs. Cleopatra released remixes of Roz's cover of David Bowie's Panic in Detroit, plus remixes of a few Christian death songs provided by bands such as Rosetta Stone, Numb, Die Krups, Spawn Ranch, Leather Strip, Noise Box, and Zero Gravity. Bands such as Wreckage, Switchblade Symphony, The Shroud, Blood Flag, and EXP have all claimed Roz Williams as an influence on their music. Commentators often use Roz's Christian death as a comparator or reference in music reviews. Former band members Rick Agnew, James McGeerty, Gatane Damone have had varying degrees of solo success. A Roz's own recording career had spanned 16 years, an output of some 20 albums with a variety of styles from extreme noise to spoken word. His discography includes 15 releases with Christian Death, 5 Shadow Project albums, 17 as Premature Ejaculation, 3 Helter releases, 1 album with EXP, 1 album with Damone, 5 solo albums, and 1 Dacus Corotta album. All this in addition to his vast body of visual art, which can be found in various collections on Amazon and the like, and his dabblings in film. His sense of style, the music he created, and the philosophies he espoused have influenced everyone from Motley Crue to Marilyn Manson and has left an impact and legacy that few would have predicted. Even today, you can hear echoes of Roz Williams in almost every piece of music that can be considered goth or death rock. During the latter part of 2006, it was announced that the original members of Christian Death would be performing together with Williams' wife, Ava O, oh, as the vocalist. The lineup consisted of James McGeerty, Christian Omar, Ava O, oh, and Jamie Pena under the moniker Christian Death 1334. In October 2017, John J. Albert, early friend of Roz's and the original guitarist for Dalkus Kuroda, and now award-winning journalist, wrote an article looking back on Roz that stated, Roz Williams, the king of death rock, hung himself in 1998. I read about it in the newspaper with my morning coffee and I cried. Not so much for the influential cult figure and Christian death frontman adored by black-clad fans throughout the world, but for Roger Painter, the funny, brave, awkward glitter rock fan from Pomona, California, who would ride his 10-speed over to my house with a backpack full of T-Rex records. You can actually see that guy in the picture where he's not singing and his eyes are closed. If you look through that kabuki-style makeup, that is my old friend. Shy, introverted, and brilliant. The two of us spent our teenage years ditching school, getting drunk, and listening to records. In the afternoons, we played minimalist punk rock in my parents' garage and then ventured out into Hollywood at night in search of adventure. When Roger changed his name to Roz and began playing a slower, darker, more complex music, I followed, 
until my own drug addiction and lack of talent prevented me from going any further. But what I remember most is our friendship in those life-defining years, and it's what pains me now. I was one of many old friends who had faded from his life by the time he needed us most. I suppose it's lonely being the king. Roz's longtime friend, collaborator, and one-time wife was Ava O. Oh. It says a great deal about their connection that the two of them would marry since most, including her, acknowledge that Roz was gay. It seems that love can truly conquer almost anything, except perhaps addiction and an unshakable depression. But Ava stayed with Roz through it all, until the very end. Ava had moved here at 18 to meet her idol, Joan Jett, which she did her very first night. She then stayed on and played in several bands before forming her own punk dirge metal trio called the Super Heroines. It was at a 1979 Super Heroines performance in Chinatown that she first met Roz. Their initial introduction was admittedly awkward, as most promising romances are. He came over and said he really liked my band, Ava says. I had seen him before and I was really into him because he was wearing a suit. I didn't know what to say, so I said thanks and walked away. A month later, Ava went to see Christian Death play a concert in San Diego. There she again met the singer along with his fearsome tattooed lover, Ron Athey. Three of them ended up living in a Long Beach apartment together. When I first saw Roz on stage, I didn't even hear the music, she says. I was looking at him and it was like this puppy love crush. But later when he came to move in, he was like Jesus to me, this holy vibe, like he was this really special person. The two of them eventually married in 1987, but he's, even as Roz's star ascended and he became a worldwide cult figure as one of the inspirations for what would later be known as goth, his descent into drugs, alcohol, and depression grew more and more grave. I think that maybe he just didn't fit into the world he was in, Ava says, and I think he was really scared when he wasn't high. I would get him off the drugs for eight or nine months, but so many people wanted his attention, so they would give him drugs. I hated it, and I couldn't watch it anymore. Eventually, Roz and Ava separated, but the two remained friends in the ensuing years, collaborating on several musical ventures and talking on the phone almost nightly. The night before Roz finally killed himself, they talked, agreeing that she would take him to the hospital in the morning. Roz had talked about suicide since we first met, Ava says. In the time before he actually did it, he told me he wasn't going to drink water, he was only going to drink alcohol. He was just letting himself die. But when I think back to that time in the 80s when we were all living together in Long Beach, it was one of the happiest times of my life. I always think about those days and I wish they had never ended. A 2008 article in LA Weekly reflected on Roz's lasting influence on California's goth scene on the 10th anniversary of his death, stating, Perhaps because of his need for constant creative change, Williams remains an obscure figure outside the gothic underworld. The press he garnered was limited to genre-oriented magazines and a handful of alternative-minded publications. His recorded work was often hard to find outside of big city record shops, and his live performances were typically confined to goth clubs, even when his latest projects were far removed from the scene he begat. He wasn't allowed to grow, he was typecast, Izzo says. It was difficult for him. Every record he did was a different concept, a different direction, and a different sound. Ten years later, Williams' iconoclastic spirit has manifested in Los Angeles in an unexpected way, as a new school of artists is twisting their own shadows. Be certain, though, this is not music formed from Halloween-shaped cookie cutters. It's very easy for a lot of bands who play in the circles we do to adhere to the stereotypes, and we are really trying to avoid that, says Stephen James of Disco Hospital, which features members of popular goth bands Scarlet Remains and All Gone Dead. Instead, the new Dark Age is focused on experimentation, a need to stay rooted in the present. These are bands often overlooked and misunderstood, not just by the indie rock establishment, but also by the still-breathing gothic underground. But with three monthly parties, Release the Bats and Bats Over Broadway in Long Beach, and MRX Wolfpack in Chinatown, a slew of LA-based festival shows, such as Wake the Dead at Safari Sam's on April 26th, The Magazine Drop Dead, and Thin Man Entertainment's forthcoming Bats from America CD compilation, this is certainly evolving into a scene in its own right. 
Inside the Long Beach Bar Kaysera, a picture of Williams is placed on the mantel surrounded by candles and other embellishments. On the fourth Friday of every month, he looks down on the tightly packed crowd, a mix of ex-goths who still love the music even though they now wear jeans, and newly legal drinkers dressed in ragtag ensembles of lace, velvet, and fishnet as they gather for Release the Bats. In a corner of the club, co-promoter Jen Bats shows me her new tattoo, a portrait of Williams on the inside of her upper arm. Every kid who listened to Christian Death changed after that, just like we did, she says. Jen and Dave Bats formed this monthly death rock party in October 1998, six months after Williams' death. It was the height of the Graver era in Los Angeles when goth influences converged with industrial and techno for a sound that often sounded like black celebration era Depeche Mode pitched up to rave frequencies. The local death rock scene had long since fallen to the sidelines of the dance floor, giving way to European electronic artists like Apoptigma Berserk and Diform. Despite this, Release the Bats was focusing on old school, combining vintage cuts of LA death rock with similarly aged British tracks. People thought death rock wasn't cool anymore, Dave recalls. But in combining past recordings with live performances from scene icons and up-and-comers, the club has helped foster a new appreciation for music that was almost lost. Now, he says, people come and they get influenced by the old stuff and they start bands. And while bands from this scene and the parties and the venues that they play at, they're all playing a new style of music, not necessarily derivative of goth rock or UK goth or anything like that, they do all agree, uh, as Tony Havoc of Disco Hospital puts it, we're trying to move things forward, put a new edge on things. We don't need another Roz. We don't need another Susie Sue. We don't need another Robert Smith. They did it right the first time. And this is an entire scene, not just scraping by, but thriving with weekly parties all over L.A., still feeling the influence of Roz Williams, the man who started it all. 20 years after his death, this is going on, and can any of us short of Elvis and the Beatles hope for anything more, any kind of bigger legend? It's hard for me to extemporize about Roz's death in the way that I'm able to with Ian Curtis because... There was so much obviously going wrong in Ian's life combined with his base personality that it was really only a matter of time for him. But Roz seemed different. Roz lived to create. So much so that he was almost manic and certainly very unorganized, constantly jumping from one project to the next, focusing only on the art. He couldn't manage finances or figure out how to work a mailing list or any of the stuff that it really is the nuts and bolts of working in the music industry. It didn't interest or concern him. He was an artist just trying to make his art. He had many friends, an entire scene he helped found, and was reportedly happy in his final days. I'm inclined to believe, as others do, that his suicide was just the next step in the art. Multiple friends and acquaintances say he seemed to be in good spirits in the days before his suicide. Sure, there were some issues, depression, a bit of drug addiction, the weight of a religious upbringing, hiding his homosexuality, etc., etc., but he was loved and constantly surrounded by people who cared and was given the great opportunity to do what he wanted to do and be who he wanted to be. It seems to me that what his life through pursuing his passions actually became the opposite of the imagery his art projected, doom and gloom makes for great art, but his world didn't seem that doomy and gloomy. The only explanation that makes sense is he did it as part of the art. Ultimately, the only one who really knows why he did it is him, and he isn't here to explain it, so all we can do is speculate. Maybe it was for his art, but maybe it was for other reasons. Maybe he really was torn apart inside more than anyone realized. Maybe the depression was crippling, Maybe the addiction was too much. Maybe the financial troubles weighed on him more than anyone realized. Maybe he was struggling with, I mean, any number of issues. You know, who knows? No one but him. Had he stuck around, the goth scene would have handed him the world on a silver platter. But maybe that's not what he wanted. Or he just didn't see it right there in front of him. You know, there's a saying that it's better to burn out than fade away. And I always struggle with that statement. Is it better to die young in your prime so you never face those later years, declining record sales, subpar art, failing health in front of the fans that look to you as a god? 
uh, or is it better to stick around as long as possible, to give your audience and yourself as much as possible, as many songs, paintings, movies, poems, whatever, as you possibly can, and give those fans and yourself time, time to get to know you, time to bask in your glow, time to see how things play out. You know, an easy go-to is always Kurt Cobain. Are, are we better off left with the abbreviated Nirvana that no doubt is as legendary as it is because Kurt cut things short? Or would, would we have been better off with an older, mature Nirvana that headlined festivals and made appearances on SNL? It's easy to say we like the Nirvana we were left with, but we really don't know. We have no means of comparison, no way to see that future that never happened just like we have no way of knowing which scenario would have been best for Roz or Ian or any of the other amazing people whose lives were cut short by whatever means. The best we can do is appreciate the legacies we're left with, share them with those who can appreciate them, and use them as a groundwork for our own legacies to be passed on to future generations to continue the cycle. That is the story of Roz Williams, our second entry in the Goth Legend series that I'll be doing uh, sporadically from time to time. I'm not sure who's going to be part three or when it's going to come out. I'm just sort of doing it whenever the fancy strikes. And that is the end of episode 20 of No Better Death. Uh, NoBetterDeath.info for all info on No Better Death. Show notes, links to social media, contact info. Listen to the show directly on the site or find links to all major platforms. I also put up a news section, Six Speaks, if you want to uh, just like kind of daily updates or whatever's going on. Maybe it's not something I put on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Just sort of letting you know where I'm at throughout the week with the new episode or putting up pictures, what have you. Go check it out, nobetterdeath.info. If you have personal experiences with death, stories you want to hear on the show, or maybe you just want to say hi to your fellow death nerds, hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, or nobetterdeath at Gmail. If you would be so kind, please subscribe, rate, review, share, retweet, whatever you do, wherever you do it, and tell your friends about the show. That's the best way to get word out. I sincerely thank you once again for tuning in, for coming back time after time. I love doing this show. You know, I, don't, I no longer feel like the weird guy in the corner asking people if they want to hear some fucked up shit. I'm the guy who's talking about fucked up shit and a crowd gathered around him to, t to hear the tale. Uh, and I would much rather be on that end of the situation, definitely. And since this episode came up so short on time, I'm a lot shorter than it had to, since I had to cut a big chunk of the script out just because it became too convoluted with too many people to keep track of, I ended up having to condense this episode down a lot. I'm going to go ahead and throw on that 28-minute interview with Roz from Golgotha Magazine back in 1997. If you don't want to stick around for a 28-minute interview, I understand. But if you're interested in learning more about Roz and hearing about him in his own words, definitely stick around for that. This has been No Better Death. I am your humble servant, Sick Grayson. Until next time, try not to die. I read in, um, in an interview that you did not long ago, I can't remember the magazine, that uh, you were a little bit hesitant about releasing from the horse's mouth because it was so personal. Um, a little bit at first, yeah, mm -hmm. just because of, of that, it's, uh, I don't know, it's really one of my favorite pieces, but, uh, it was just so personal, the whole experience of writing it, mm -hmm. and, and everything that, but I, I mean, I kind of felt the same way when I, uh, released Every King a Bastard Son, it was, you know, yeah, those are like the most personal, introspective looks at myself. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of weird when you're like, oh, well, other people are going to hear that too. <laughs> uh, was it a good healing method? Oh, yeah, it was. Actually, I think it's about the, uh, the only thing that really saved me at that point was <laughs> sitting down and, and writing out this stuff. Well, the well, last time that we spoke, we had spoken a lot with uh, about a lot of the projects that you've been involved with over the years. And um, well, this time around, I'd like to touch on maybe... Uh, you know, like Roz as a person, you know, who Roz is, the man behind the music, <laughs> okay. if you will. <laughs> um, because I've followed you throughout the years, and, you know, it's just, I, I kind of want to get a look at the man behind the music. And, um, I don't know, a question that I have here is, how, how old were you when the thoughts of man's mortality became a question? 
And how did this affect, what effect did this have on your life? Um, I mean, I, I would say pretty early on, um, since I was, I was raised in a, in a very religious home, those ideas were, you know, pretty much uh, around from birth, although I didn't, you know, pay them much attention until Mm -hmm. maybe around nine or ten or something, and mm -hmm. which is, you know, the same time when I discovered that it was music that I wanted to be doing with my life. Right. Um, but uh, affecting me, it was, uh, well, as I, as I told people before, the, like, the writing of the, of the first album was basically a reaction uh, to what I was hearing from my parents and, right. and so forth, uh, uh, things that I didn't really like mm -hmm. what I was hearing when I was hearing them. <laughs> and, um, I was kind of like, you know, I thought some things were put in the wrong way and, right. uh, you know, it was kind of like this fear factor, you know, playing, mm -hmm. playing a role and, um, so the first album was kind of written in reaction to that and, and exercising some of that out of myself. You know? Right. Through a lot of your work, you, see, you seem to exhibit the darker side of uh, things. Growing up, uh, were your childhood fascinations fixed more on the morbose? Uh, hmm. I don't know if I'd say any more so than anybody growing up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh -huh. I mean, you know, I wasn't, wasn't like fascinated by anything really growing up besides, besides music, mm. um, which isn't in itself too dark or morbid. <laughs> but, um, you know, of course, as I said, you know, I, I thought about other things because of the uh, the religious aspect and and certain things that were told to me at the time and how, uh, you know, mm -hmm. dreams, which I find very important to, mm -hmm. to waking life, you know, at the time were considered to be of the devil. And, mm -hmm. and you know, well, <laughs> of course I dream. So yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, the devil must be in there somewhere under my bed or <laughs> my head or something. And so, you know, I mean, those thoughts would arise, but... Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I never really dwelled on anything. It's just uh, what next record I was going to buy. <laughs> yeah. Would you consider yourself a paranoid human being? <laughs> <laughs> At times, definitely. Not, not most of the time. Really? But uh, I mean, there are certainly times when uh, I become a bit paranoid and mm -hmm. a bit agoraphobic. <laughs> I, I have a lot of people say to me, you know, I bet you he carries a handgun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd be afraid to own a handgun. <laughs> put it that way. Knock too many people off. <laughs> yeah, or myself, or, mm -hmm. you know, probably by accident, <laughs> which would be absolutely ridiculous. But, but uh, no, I'd say... Uh, I don't know. I deal with things okay. Mm -hmm. Kind of involved in my own world, so it's when I have to uh, to be a part of the so-called real world, it's just <laughs> I don't know. You know, I'm I'm kind of like put myself somewhere different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there a particular item or something? I mean. Um that you endeared most as a child, like a particular item, whether it be, you know, something given to you or... Yeah. As a child, uh, not really, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've always been one to collect things and uh, a bit of a pack rat in that <laughs> 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 um, you know, like like I said, mostly when I was uh, when I was a child, uh, it was you know my fascination was just collecting records and, right. and music, and I I did have a skull collection for really? a while when I was younger. You know, just like 
little plaster skull. <laughs> there was, I remember my mother telling me I had to put them away once. My <laughs> grandmother was coming <laughs> Were you the kind of child that would go out and uh, join in with the other ch children in the neighborhood? And, uh, uh, not really. You're more no. secluded. <laughs> <laughs> I think in, uh, in elementary school I was a bit more attentive to other people around me. And uh huh. Then uh, as I kind of got to, to the end of elementary and like junior high and stuff, I was just kind of more of a loner. Mm hmm. <laughs> would you say that you were, um, as a child, were, would you say that you were the bully or the bully -er? <laughs> Oh, I was uh, not a bully, no. <laughs> no. In fact, at one point in high school, I had to get myself a bodyguard. Well, actually, he offered to be my bodyguard. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mechanics class woodshop guy. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, did you ever just like snap out on somebody and completely surprise them, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Just... I mean, sometimes you have to. You mm -hmm. know, I, I would normally just, uh, <clears throat> you know, even even with my life today, it's like, you know, I normally <laughs> just try to ignore situations where, you know, people are just being idiots because I feel like, well, you know, <laughs> there's no reason for me to get on that same level with them but right but then again you know there's there's a point where people can push too far and then mm -hmm. you know something has to be done <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, uh, were you a good student in high school or did you not really care about school too much uh, no basically they, the only reasons i went to school were to like meet up with a couple of friends and then ditch school for the day <laughs> care much for what they had to talk to me about. Were you fond of music class? Um, I never, I've never taken any music classes. Really? No. <laughs> I liked my art class for a while, but that was like really the only thing. I wanted to take driver's education just to see the films, but mm -hmm. I never ended up taking it. But now they're on video, so <laughs> I guess I didn't miss it. <laughs> I know that you have a, um, a fascination for serial killers. Um, I have an interest. An I don't interest. Know if it's a fascination, but uh, an interest, yeah. Okay, I have a question for you. I don't even know if you've ever thought of before, so I don't know how you how you'll be able to answer this. But uh, hypothetically speaking, uh, if you if you were a serial killer, um, what would your trademark be, and who who would your uh, targets be? <laughs> That might be a little more information than I need to give out. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I was actually thinking about this a few days ago. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I, well, I was talking to some friends, and uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I, I read a lot about, uh, I mean, various different killers and stuff, but mostly my... My main thing is men who kill other men or boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that, I mean, if I were to do something, I, it would be the same. It would either be a man or a boy that I would kill, uh -huh. men or boys. I don't know why, though. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, being gay, it's kind of weird. That <laughs> but but uh, I don't know. I just think if I killed a woman, it would just be out of pure anger uh -huh. and frustration that killing a man would, I know this sounds bizarre, but kind of be more out of an act of love in a way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, but I don't know if I would have any particular, like, style or MO, <laughs> you know, I'm uh -huh. not sure. Uh -huh. I'd probably want to leave something behind, uh -huh. like, you know, just some kind of identifying mark, but <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that would be. And, and if I decide two years from now to actually start doing it, if I told you, then <laughs> I'd blow it right there. <laughs> Do you find yourself frequently fighting the dark angel on your shoulder, who's uh, edging or perhaps egging you on, and tempting you to do things that you would wish to refrain from? Um, well, there are occasions, <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's not... Uh, 
I don't know, it's not really something that um, is like an overpowering thing. Mm -hmm. you know? It's just something that I realize is there and that, you know, just like anything else needs to be dealt with, you know. Mm -hmm. at, at certain times it'll be like, hey, you know, yeah. <laughs> remember me? you got to do something. <laughs> Is there a belief um, that you believe in so strongly that you would be willing to take your life for? you could, uh, you know, relate or if you can even understand where people, uh, these religious groups, uh, cults, even if you will, such as like the Heaven's Gate, you know, obviously they all took their own life, you know. Right. Um, can you understand people for wanting to do something like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can totally understand it. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, I mean, it, it almost seems reasonable when given a lot of other choices or, you know, or so-called answers. Mm-hmm are out there, you know, it's like, well, you know, you have to kind of wonder, well, is that any less reasonable to to believe that than, than you know, all this other stuff that's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, well, you know, maybe I've seen the comet a couple times now, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it's like, well, maybe they are behind there just waving and laughing at all the rest of us, you know? <laughs> An interesting question that, uh, I don't know, I thought it'd be neat to ask you is, how do you feel about uh, genetic cloning, this big rage that's going on, everybody's talking about? Uh, it's, uh, it's frightening to me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's frightening that people have, like, got, I, I guess, progressed. I, I'm kind of hesitant to use that word, but, you know, it's, it's kind of frightening that people have, gotten that far to where they feel, where they even feel the need to do something like that, you know? It's right. like, well, you know, but I, I guess they kind of see that in the process of what they're doing, they're destroying everything anyway, so they might as well try to figure out a way to recreate things that they're destroying. Yeah. You know? But it's like, sorry, by that time, you know, it's all too late. Yeah. You know? It's like, just let things be, and mm -hmm. you won't have to worry about cloning and all this shit. Yeah. Half breeding animals, different <laughs> animals, and like, you know, well, what is the, what is the point in that? I you know. know. Like, what 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 could you, you know, possibly <laughs> benefit from creating like a half pig, half sheep? Uh. You know? It's like, oh well, that's nice. You know, yeah. another, another freak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot of the debate about it is whether these clones perhaps even have souls. Uh, you know, how do you feel? How, how do you feel about that? I don't think anything man-made has a soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are like, I mean, I some friends. Well, I call them friends. Um, who are? Well, I get. I mean, if you were generally to look at them, they're inanimate objects. But mm -hmm. to me. I call them my friends because they ha they have a life. Yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that they have a soul, and, but they have a life. Mm-hmm. You know, that uh, is like you know. I mean, I I guess a lot of people would say, well, you know, you've created that life for them, but not necessarily so. They have told me <laughs> their life story. So, you know, but 
I don't, I don't think anything man-made has a soul. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get back to uh, music a little bit here. Um, you know the new album from The Horse's Mouth? Is there a particular song? I know the whole experience was pretty personal for you, but is there a particular song that, um, you know, is the most personal? personal? Um, probably, uh, well, I, I think probably this piece called December 30th, 1334. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I don't know, it was a, a suicide note that I had written, uh, and I was just about to take my life at that point. And so this was the uh, little message that I had to to uh, relate to my friends and family, and mm-hmm. and then uh, seeing that I didn't actually go through with it, I was like, well, <laughs> I might as well put it on this CD, <laughs> share it with everyone. So yeah, that that one's that one's fairly uh, fairly personal on on that level. That mm-hmm. Then there's a, another piece called Her Only Sin, right. which, you know, just basically sums up <laughs> my whole state of physical and mental health at the time. Mm-hmm. Are, are your parents still, like, around, living? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, after hearing pieces of such that they know are personal, did they ever you know, say to you, hey, we never knew, you know, you felt this way about anything. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of my work that they haven't heard, not, mm-hmm. not necessarily because I wouldn't want them to, or, mm-hmm. or because they haven't asked, mm-hmm. but, uh, it's just something that's like, you know, some things they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, when the first album came out with Christian Death, I was like, terrified that they find it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried hiding it while I went away for a while and I came back and they had found it and listened to it. They were like, well, we really like the music, but we don't quite understand where you're coming from with the lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, you should understand perfectly well. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, with the horse's mouth, that's something that I kind of, there, there are certain things that uh, I just feel don't need to be, uh, I guess, I, I guess shared with them, mm-hmm. you know, right. it, it, it is like really kind of a difficult thing for me to call and, you know, just like say, you know, well, hey, guess what I'm gay, <laughs> you know, yeah. so my mom's response was just like, you know, well, son, I'm not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> supportive of your music career? Um, yeah, actually. Like I said, they were not, not too pleased with, um, you know, the lyrics and, and, you know, they would hear about certain shows or see photographs or whatever, and mm-hmm. they, they would be a bit, you know, <laughs> well, we don't really understand it, but, you know, they, they have always been supportive of it. Yeah, that's cool. Are you planning on, uh, doing any t- uh, tours anywhere for this new album? Um, I don't really know. Right now I'm, I've been working on a, on a film, and uh, so my energy has been all directed towards that right now. Really? Uh, what kind of film is it? Um, it's a short film, but, well, about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, just, just black and white, and then I, I have a soundtrack that I've really? got to do to that. Wow. Hmm. Um, so, you know, most of my energies have been focused in on that, and when I get that finished up, I'm just looking for, for band members, mm-hmm. but I haven't, you know, I haven't thought too much about touring or whatnot yet, because mm. it's, it's 
been focusing in on this, which is, I mean, I, it's something I've never worked in before a film. So uh, are you directing it all your, is it all your creative idea, or you have outside help? I, I'm working with uh, another friend of mine, so we're kind of like co-directing, but the story is from, from a story of mine. Uh, can you reveal any information about it, you know, anything? What it's um, a, I can give you the title of the film, which is Pig, uh-huh. and uh, basically it's the story of a killer and his victim. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it goes a bit deeper than that, but... <laughs> uh-huh. uh, how will you be releasing this? Um, well, in Europe, uh, I'm pretty sure that he's going to do it himself, because he... Uh, does you know film and, and video work over there? Mm -hmm. Has quite good distribution. Um, and here, I, I guess he's just kind of looking for someone who's interested. Mm -hmm. you know, we'll try to get some some showings at some you know smaller theaters around town. And, are you, you know. are you going to have it on any uh, you know video cassettes selling? You know? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to uh, put it onto video. And, uh, see how that goes. Yeah, but yeah I'm kind of excited because I'm looking at the uh, all of the first rushes of what we've shot so far tonight. So mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> I finally get to see it. <laughs> wow, that's great. I'll definitely have to get a copy. Uh, that's that seems like really interesting. Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Are Are you gonna incorporate? Uh, Anything, if whenever you do decide to go on tour, if you're getting into film a little bit, are you going to incorporate any special effects or anything into any, maybe a little bit of a theater presence to any stage shows? Um, possibly, possibly. I mean, that's something that I've always, you know, been interested in, of course, being, being a, uh, I guess, I guess you would call me an ex Bowie fan, but, mm -hmm. well, I still like Bowie, but <laughs> just up to a period. <laughs> But, uh, you know, and Alice Cooper, and I've always liked theatrics in rock music and the mm -hmm. idea of blending the two. So, you know, that's, that's always a possibility for me, you know. It's always an option that I know is available. Yeah. Um, is there a particular film that you've, uh, that you've most enjoyed ever that, you know, perhaps you kind of... Uh, influenced you in the way that you've created your own little movie? Mm. It's a difficult question because there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, <coughs> this is kind of more, I think, influenced by uh, um, like the films of the surrealist period. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, obviously since it's silent, a lot of the early silent horror films. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a silent film? Um, Did you yeah, say? just mm -hmm. with soundtrack, there's no uh -huh. dialogue. Right. And, uh, are you the starring member? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, there's just two of us. Oh, it's, the yeah. Cast. But, uh, yeah, so I'm in it, but uh, never... <laughs> are you the killer or the... <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I'm kind of living my fantasy world out on film. <laughs>
of one of these remixes, do you fear that they're, they're going to uh, interpret what you, the work that you have done as, you know, dance? Well, yeah, that, that's a possibility, you know, <laughs> which is kind of frightening. To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I don't know. I, I guess if they, uh, if they did and then heard uh, the original. anything else, they would uh, they'd get it. But right. Yeah, that is, that is a bit frightening. God, you didn't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, well, that's nice. Um, like I said, um, you were, uh, Christ, what's it been, 15 years? Uh, well, yeah, about, about close, to, yeah. close to 15 years. And um, we just feel that uh, the music that you create is always innovative, and it never stays the same, and it's always progressing. And, uh, you know, we just really feel like you're creating a really, you're uh, actually one of the only musicians out there right now that I can really think of that's, uh, that still does anything worthwhile. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> that's, that's quite something. Thank yeah. you.